are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here I interview brain scientists of all types and discuss their work, as well as the latest developments, issues, and controversies in the field of brain mapping. Today, my guest is Anastasia Yendiki, who has been advancing the field of diffusion MRI tractography since she started at the MGH Martino Center in 2005. She has worked to advance the tools, the precision, interpretability, and the applications of MRI-based diffusion tractography. Dr. Yendiki is a faculty member at the MGH Martino Center and also a member of the Laboratory for Computational Neuroimaging. Her background is in statistical signal image processing. She received her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where she worked on inverse problems in tomographic reconstruction for nuclear imaging. As a postdoctoral research fellow, also at the Martino Center, uh, she trained in functional and diffusion-weighted MRI. She's responsible for the development of diffusion MRI analysis tools in FreeSurfer, including Tracula, which stands for Tracks Constrained by Underlying Anatomy. It's a diffusion-weighted MRI analysis stream in Bruce Fischel's FreeSurfer uh, for automatically reconstructing a set of major white matter pathways from diffusion MRI data using global probabilistic tractography with anatomical priors. She's also interested in ex vivo imaging of human brain circuits with diffusion MRI and optical imaging to both validate and train algorithms for in vivo tractography. In this wide reaching discussion, we delve into all aspects of her work developing tractography, including her work on creating better algorithms, uh, some of the current unknowns and the challenges in the field, her validation studies, some clinical applications, and also uh, the connectome scanner uh, at MGH. Towards the end, we discuss the planned connectome 2 scanner and some of the most uh, exciting challenges and, and mysteries, in some sense, the field faces. Enjoy. Thanks for coming. Uh, Anastasia Yendeki, is that the right way you pronounce your first name? Or? It's actually Anastasia. So Anastasia. It's, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like Maria, you know? Ah, okay. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for correcting me. I didn't want to make that wrong when I introduced you, but, uh, but yeah, Anastasia uh, Yandiki, thanks for coming on the podcast. And today we're just going to, you know, go over your, you know, a, a lot of work that you've done in diffusion imaging and track tracing. And uh, most of it is, has been done, if not all of it has been done from the time period that you came to MGH Martino Center in 2010 to about now. But before we get into that, I just wanted to, I usually start out by, by asking a little bit about how you got here, how you got to, to where you are right now and, and what initially you know, made you interested in doing this type of work. And you know, if there's anyone who was like a mentor or figure in your life or whatever that influenced you. Um, thanks, Peter. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I should say that I got to the Martino Center at 2005. Oh, okay. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. 2005. That's right. Yes. Okay. And it was a bit of a torturous path how I got to tractography eventually. But when I arrived at the center, I didn't know anything about brains and I knew very little about MRI, actually, only what I had learned about MRI from grad school coursework. My training is in electrical engineering. I did my PhD at the University of Michigan with Jeff Fessler, working in um, statistical image reconstruction methods for emission tomography, so for nuclear imaging. But the way that I was trained was that you learn certain mathematical tools and then you can apply them to all sorts of different imaging modalities. And in fact, in the group there, there were um, other students working on other modalities, some even um, working on MRI. And so my thinking naturally coming out of, of Jeff's group was that, well, now I can go and learn a different modality, you know, um, expand my repertoire. So for me at that time, you know, data was just Y and the thing that we're trying to image was X. And my job was to get an estimate of X from Y. And um, so Y could be anything. 
And what I decided was going to be the next modality that I wanted to learn for my postdoc was actually fMRI. And where that came from was that in the process of uh, coming up with um, a mathematical result for my uh, thesis and, and analytical approximation, I used certain results from Gaussian random field theory that had been applied to fMRI. And so I had read some papers and I thought, well, maybe this is a natural jump off point to you know, my next um, gig. And it seemed like a very active research area, of course. I had no idea where to go to learn that. Um, thankfully, there was someone on my thesis who, uh, committee who could help with that. And so I received a numbered list of places one would go to to learn about fMRI. And the number one item on the list was the Martino Center. And the contact person there was Bruce Fischel. At the time, I had no idea what any of those words meant. <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know what free surfer was. I didn't know anything about the center or Bruce. But you know, I looked him up and I shoot I shot him an email and you know I uh, got an interview. So cool. that's how I got to the center. Now, one thing that happened in the interview, the plot twist that gets me to tractography is that uh, in the process of speaking to various people at the center, even outside the free surfer group, I saw the, the tracts on someone's um, monitor for the first time, you know, the classical spaghetti brain picture with all the colors. And I learned uh, how that comes out of um, MRI scans, that there are these water molecules that uh, move around the brain and you can sort of fill in the blanks and uh, come up with the pictures of, uh, of how the fibers are organized. And I thought that that was the most science fiction thing I had ever heard in my life. <laughs> and already in my mind during that, you know, 10 minute uh, description of it, I had started thinking how I could apply the, the methods that I had learned in my PhD to this modality. And so that's when the seed got planted, even though at the time there was no diffusion imaging research happening in the free surfer group uh, per se. Okay. Okay. But I, I persisted and um, eventually switched to that field. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it was a good jump as well. I mean, it's, well, certainly fMRI has a lot of interesting, you know, ways you can apply mathematics, of course. But, um, but yeah, it seems that diffusion imaging, you know, it's funny. Uh, um, you mentioned the people at M MGH and Martino Center. I remember when I was there, or even uh, maybe it was a little bit after, I think uh, like Van Wadeen was was doing some of this work in the heart and, and it was a little bit of here of that here and there, but that was that was about it. And and yeah, certainly there's there's a critical mass of people who are very smart uh, uh, there, and so it's really nice to be surrounded by those people, even if it's not their primary area of expertise. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, it was kind of a crazy thing to do in retrospect to switch into a field that was both new to me and to the group that I joined here. It's not something that would I would advise <laughs> someone to do necessarily. However, I'm, I'm glad I, I did it and I'm glad that I, I persisted through the, the difficulties of trying to parachute into a field where you don't know anyone and where no one knows you. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's impressive. That really is impressive. And but it sort of speaks in some sense to the, you know, one, the, the center and yourself, but also, I mean, the field itself. I mean, there, there's there's always been these these luminaries in the field like like Derek Jones or, you know, obviously early on, you know, Daniel Hahn and Peter Basser. But but it seems that, yeah, you, there's not uh, I mean, I mean, they're certainly missing many centers, but uh, but it seems that the, the, there's not like collective body of expertise any any one place uh, over the years and but certainly that's you know now you've sort of grown this group in in some sense where so, so now martino center is considered uh you know one of the best places for well i wouldn't say that that's because of me but yeah we do have our, our own little diffusion tribe now that has a lot to do with the connectom 2.0 project that was spearheaded by suzy huang and um thomas Vizel who was still at the center at the time. And so like every place, the, the Martino Center has its tribes. And like every place, the Martino Center has its uh, founding fathers, you know, like the Bruce's and the Larry's of, of the world. And in the beginning, if you wanted to work on image analysis, you know, you would work with Bruce special, obviously. And if you wanted to work closer to the 
acquisition, you know, the, the sequence development or image reconstruction, you would you would be in Larry's group. The thing with diffusion imaging, especially as it has evolved over the last few years, is that really there is a continuum from how the data are acquired to how the signal is modeled to how the parameters that come out of that model are then analyzed on the whole brain, that if you slice it up in any way, you're really missing something. And so it was clear that we needed uh, to have a place where the people who are working on all of those different sides of the problem, uh, that entire continuum could come together. And the Connection 2.0 project was definitely, and my collaboration with Susie Huang was definitely an opportunity to start that kind of little tribe, you know, under the, of course, the the shadows of the <laughs> uh, the big founding fathers. Uh, yeah. And of course, we all maintain our links with, um, you know, with the original, the, the OG tribes. And it's great to be able to go back and, you know, if I, I have a question about image segmentation or image registration, it's great to have the free server group to go back and ask. But it's also nice to have our own little diffusion tribe. Yeah. And, and on top of the, the tribes, I love that analogy because um, <laughs> it really does describe, you know, right, the dynamics of MGH. And then you know, you have this whole cloud of users, potential collaborators who, who care about various clinical disorders and neuroscience questions and things like that, that just are just dying to use these techniques, it seems. And so it's perfect, perfect environment. In, in preparing for this podcast, I tried to educate myself a little bit on the, you know, what's occurred over the last, you know, 20 years in diffusion tensor. And I just images, I just, I just uh, interviewed uh, Denis Lebihan, who talked about some oh, of the... Wow. Be between there, like Libby Han and, and Peter Basser, they made these, you know, stunning maps early on of uh, fractional anisotropy and then, you know, diffusion tensors uh, using six gradient directions. And, and they were, they were nice. And so, uh, you know, without going to, you know, obviously you could talk for hours on this, but um, how has, you know, what, what do you think have been the, like the, the, the main conceptual uh, advances in you know, from that to, you know, what you're doing now, biography uh, over the years, just to, you know, just to give the sketch of the outline. <laughs> yeah, so that that first introduction of the diffusion tensor was, um, it was a, a big deal. It allowed us to make, for the first time, to make images of the fiber bundles in the brain in vivo and non-invasively. Before that, the only way you can, uh, you could image those bundles in the human brain was to actually take a, a post-mortem brain apart. Yeah. Um, so with, uh, with diffusion tensor imaging, uh, the basic idea was that you take a bunch of measurements that tell you how easy or difficult it is for water molecules to move in every possible direction. And if you pick out the direction in which it's easiest for them to move in, that is the direction parallel to the axons. And so based on that, you come up with this uh, vector map of the preferential diffusion direction in every voxel in the brain. And then with this vector map, you can sort of connect the dots and, and follow the vectors around the brain and, and um, come up with these images of the fiber bundles. So that was, that was the first uh, big deal. Eventually, people figured out that the tensor was imperfect in the sense that it could give you a single direction for um, every location in the brain, but at the resolution that uh, we can possibly image the brain in vivo with MRI, which at the time was at best two millimeters, there are going to be multiple fiber bundles in every voxel in the brain. And so you needed some other way to infer multiple directions of diffusion rather than just one. And so for the next, I would say about 15 years, the field has been focused on uh, doing that and specifically focused on, on solving the crossing fiber problem. And so uh, different approaches were introduced, either trying to fit multiple tensors in every voxel or other models that explicitly included multiple bundles per uh, voxel and all the way up to what's called the orientation distribution function that tells you how easy, how likely the water molecules can, can move in every possible direction. And then you can pick out all the directions in which it's easy for them to move and potentially reconstruct, uh, you know, multiple fibers crossing in every voxel. In parallel to that, the data quality has improved vastly in the last five or 10 years or so. Yeah. And that had a lot to do with the Human Connectome Project. So as the methods for analyzing the data improved, also 
the data quality, there, there was a big jump there from pre-human connectome to post-human connectome. And, and what caused that that development in, in data quality? I'm just kind of curious. Um, you know, and we'll talk certainly about the, the connectome scanner. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was it just the gradient? I mean, it's RF, it's gradients, it's everything, stability. It was the um, the highest grade, uh, the higher gradient um, strength. So the the G max. Basically, the the way to improve your diffusion contrast is you get that diffusion contrast by playing some uh, gradient pulses, and the way to improve the contrast is either to make those pulses longer or to make them stronger. If you make them longer, you wait too long until you can collect the data, so you lose signal to noise ratio. So it's better to make them stronger uh, without having to make them longer. And the way to make them stronger is to make the gradients of, of the scanner stronger. And that's what the Connectome scanner and all the other product scanners that came after that, like the Prisma, et cetera, and from other um, manufacturers as well, are doing. They have those stronger gradients so that you can do better diffusion imaging without loss of SNR. Okay. So the, the knob that uh, that where you choose the uh, contrast is the B value. So you can get higher B values. You can also get higher spatial resolution. We have sequences now also thanks to the Human Connectome project that are accelerated uh, with simultaneous multi-slice acquisition. So the spatial resolution has improved the number of directions you can acquire in a certain number of time uh, increased and the B value increased. So you, you got something in pretty much every axis where you would want to, to improve data quality. Uh, and, and might as well get into this a little bit now. So in terms of, you know, and that's actually a nice, a nice way of putting it in terms of increasing increasing contrast with increasing B values. You know, of mm -hmm. course, you know, at some point, right, even if you get really strong, the, you know, your ramp times might be too long still. And so that's a tricky, you know, you have to have slightly higher slew rates, but then that's, you know, biologic limits in terms of how fast you can ramp and that sort of thing. But, but also I was wondering, um, and this is something that always occurred. I mean, and you mentioned this a little bit in your papers in terms of, you know, the optimal B value is, is mm -hmm. that, you know, at some point, it seems like you get diminishing returns if you have too high of a B value, because you get, you know, only the, you know, the local diffusion and you don't get it, you know, bouncing off the structures as, as much. I mean, mm -hmm. those are something about that, uh, the B value that's optimal in that regard. Yeah. So, it turns out that to uh, reconstruct the orientation distribution function, you don't need super high B values. Um, this was shown in simulations early on that basically up until you know three to to four thousand, you know, you can get improvements, but not beyond that. And so then it becomes a question of is it that the higher B values don't help tractography at all? Or is it that the methods that we're using, the uh, orientation distribution functions, were designed to work on the data that we had, let's say, 10 years ago, okay. uh, where we couldn't go that high in the B value? And so by reducing the data to an, an ODF, maybe you are discarding the extra information that we have worked so hard on the, the data acquisition side to add. Yes. Um, and so the next step, I think, will be to figure out what other additional relevant information is in the data that we have now and that we will have a few years from now. And if there is additional information that's relevant to tractography, how to how to extract it from the data. Well, that's interesting. So, so right. So there still might be information there. It's just a matter of finding the right way of looking at it mm -hmm. in that regard. So, so I sort of, I cut you off. So, um, and so, right. So as far as advancing over the years. And so one quick question within that. So just a quick for the audience itself, uh, you know, is it mostly, so you're certain it's, it's just axons or it's not, um, you know, other things, other, other structures, dendrites, whatever you're, it, the idea though, that it is axons primarily as far as um, what, what diffusion is uh, with the tractography is following in that regard. So. So you, you can extract information about a lot of different types of structures with diffusion MRI. MRI already is a very programmable kind of modality. Uh, you know, there are so many knobs you can turn, but diffusion imaging adds another extra layer of, um, of knobs on top of that. So there are many different ways in which you can play out those uh, gradient pulses 
And you can sensitize the signal to different types of structure, in whether in the white matter or also in the gray matter. And so there is that whole um, area of microstructural imaging that is um, very a very active field within um, diffusion MRI. As far as uh, reconstructing connectional anatomy, you know what is connected to what. Uh, we are interested in in the accents, uh, the you know the old fashioned um, accents, yeah, um, yeah. and so there are ways in which we can validate the extent to which um, the external orientations that we get from diffusion MRI match um, the ground truth, and and that has been some of my. Uh, my recent, uh, the focus of my recent work in the last five years or so. Yeah, and we'll, and and definitely we're going to be talking about that. Um, so, so I think that so as as far as you were, what I felt was your major contribution, uh, at least um, you know it's already fourteen years ago, or wait, no, <laughs> actually no, ten years ago, ten years ago it came out, and I guess there's at least I traced it back to the a paper in neuroinformatics about um, 11. Yeah. 2011, 2011 uh, automated probabilistic uh, reconstruction of white matter pathways and health and disease using an atlas of the underlying anatomy, which you, you, you termed it uh, Tracula. Yes. Uh, and so, so do you want to uh, describe that just a yeah. little bit, the advantage of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea for that goes back to how FreeSurfer does subcortical segmentation and and cortical parcellation, actually. Um, So those uh, early algorithms that that Bruce Fischel developed in the early 00s, um, and those algorithms use information about the relative location of different structures. So, you know, if you think about the putamen and the pallidum, which one is to the left of which? Yeah. Um, Those relative locations of things is is pretty reproducible uh, across brains, even across species. And certainly I can't think of any disease where, you know, these things would swap places, right? So the, the, the size of different structures and the relative size of different structures might change, might be different across individuals and might change as a, a result of disease, but their relative positions are pretty stable. And so I was tasked with applying something like this to tractography. And so that's what uh, what Tricula does. It uses information about the relative position now of white matter tracts with respect to the surrounding structures from the free surfer cortical parcellation and subcortical segmentation. So we walk along each of the major white matter bundles, let's say the corticospinal tract. And so at every point along the trajectory of the corticospinal tract, we look at to our left, right, anterior, posterior, et cetera, et cetera, and see who is our nearest neighbor. And so we build up these prior probability distributions that tell us how likely a certain tract is to go through or next to each uh, brain structure. And again, it turns out that these, this information is, is pretty reliable and pretty uh, stable across individuals and and across um, um, disease and and age group, et cetera. Um, And it also turns out that it's how anatomists describe white matter bundles. So if you open up an anatomy book, they're not going to tell you, you know, MNI coordinates. They're going to tell you this fiber bundle, you know, goes lateral to the structure and then it courses around the the other structure, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice because that information, then you can take it from a a paper that talks about monkeys and you can apply it to a human uh, because exactly it's, it's very reproducible. So what that then does, right. So I love the idea of, of using, you know, priors uh, as much as possible, anatomic priors to, to at least, so does it, does it, uh, it allows some amount of automation. I mean, it does, allows a lot of automation, but, but there's always a risk, obviously, in, in doing any priors that you're sort of potentially limiting interesting things happening. But like you said, I mean, the, the chances of, of, you know, having structures switched around, but, but they're, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of how, what the limits of, of this approach are in, in a sense, if you're trying to sort of, let's say you have two populations and there's just a little bit of a difference in the tortuosity of a track um, that is within some sort of spatial prior. How do you make sure that you don't just sort of not see that, if you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the good thing about looking at uh, just the neighboring structures and the relative positions, you know, who is to the left of who, 
um, is that the shape of the bundles and the structures can be different. You know, they can be thinner or uh, wider in different populations, but the, the neighborhood, the relative position is going to follow them wherever they go. So it's, it's actually a way to not over constrain things. Yeah. Because if you just were, if you were just taking two ROIs from an atlas, let's say from MNI space, and you put them, you you slap them onto your individual, and you say, "I want the track to go through these two ROIs." Essentially, you're constraining the absolute location of these of this bundle to be the same to within the accuracy of the across subject registration across all your individuals. But if you're just uh, constraining the relative location of things, that's actually leaving a lot of space for individual variability. And also it leaves a lot of space for things like branching and uh, fanning and, and things like that mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, that's great. That's really nice. I mean, it's it saves, obviously, you know, right in the early days, people were you know, trying to place a seed and then and then hoping that it ended up there, or else placing two seeds and that it was sort of overly constrained in some sense. And just to take this a, a, a little bit further, just to maybe to circle back a little bit on, you know, we, we were starting to talk about some of the issues in terms of like, you know, resolving crossing fibers or, you know, differentiating whether they're whether they're touching and, and going away or whatever. So are there any improvements? So I know that there's there's limits to the, the gradients. And even with the highest gradient you get, uh, it seems that you still can't resolve the spatial angle. And also with the highest resolution, it's still, you know, there's still always potential problems like that. Do you, do you think that, and, and so we could just get into your, you're talking about you know, ver- verifying that with your, mm-hmm. some of your uh, polarization sensitive optical coherence tomography or other things like that. So, so where is the field right now in terms of how certain they are, uh, what the mm-hmm. limits of that are? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So there are certain things that we can do really well with diffusion imaging. And that's you know what we just talked about. So certain uh, highways of the brain that have been well characterized in the anatomy, being able to find them reliably from and automatically from diffusion data. And actually, we, we showed, uh, I went to put a little plug in there for a recent uh, preprint by Chiara Maffei that's hopefully going to be published soon, that actually this is, diffusion imaging is so good at doing that, that you don't need actually the super duper connectum data. So that if you train the algorithm from that super duper data, then the user can have much uh, more regular, you know, B value of 1000 and, and 64 direction data and still be able to reconstruct those main highways. Yeah. So for those kinds of things, we're doing really well. <laughs> now, the, it may seem a little unambitious or you know not particularly exciting that you're just going to use it to find the things that that you know exist. In a sense, that's exactly what we do with T1 scans, right? We ask of the T1 scan where is the hippocampus and where is the amygdala. We don't ask of it to reveal the the hidden uh, structure of the brain. But from diffusion imaging, people have had higher expectations. And so when we go to ask to the point where we're asking those kinds of questions, you know, asking the diffusion uh, scan to tell us what is connected to what, that is when things get harder. That is where the validation um, of diffusion MRI comes in and why there is um, a lot of interest in this right now. For me personally, the the two main influences there with the postmortem validation one was, of course, Bruce Fischel, who was already doing a lot of postmortem imaging, you know, since the time that I just arrived at, at the Martino Center. And of course, his interests are mainly in the gray matter, you know, looking for side architectonic boundaries and, and things like that. Yeah. But he was really talking about this since then, that ex vivo MRI can become a, a method for uh, undistorted histology. Uh, because you can collect the images in 3D rather than having to slice up the the tissue in a certain way and then be stuck with that slicing. And also how you can leave the brain in the scanner for days and get very high SNR. So those are ideas were still uh, were, were there already. And I wanted to apply them to the white matter. And that's where the, the big influence for me has been uh, working with Suzanne Haber, who is a neuroanatomist who has done tracer injection studies for decades and has a very impressive um, collection uh, of tracer data. 
and who's uh, the person that I know that knows the most about connectional anatomy. And so we're using a, um, our group uses a combination of these approaches. So using the uh, comparison to tracer injection studies in uh, non-human primates in collaboration with Suzanne, and where we scan the, uh, we do diffusion scans on the brains where she has done the tracer injections, um, as well as a collaboration with the optics core um, in the Martino Center and specifically with uh, Hui Wang, uh, who does the optical coherence tomography with uh, polarization sensitivity that allows us to get direct measurements of axonal orientations in the human brain now. Um, not in the whole brain at the moment. Uh, so that is something that we can only do in, in smaller fields of view. But there is one thing I've learned from doing this is that there is no perfect source of uh, the ground truth for the entire brain, for everything in the entire brain. <laughs> um, so we have to combine you know, the, the relative strengths of, of different approaches um, and come with um, converging results from, from different methods. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, some earlier, I mean, that, you know, the, the polarization sensitive techniques have been only around for a few years. I remember seeing, yeah. you know, Carl Zillis giving a beautiful talk on, on you know, and I was just blown away by the, yeah. and of course those are post-mortem brains and, and it's sort of, and you have to still worry about, you know, precise registration, I guess, between between that and, and the MR slices, I mean, the MR. Yeah, so that that is an issue with techniques that have to slice the brain before imaging it. Um, and so what you uh, what you saw probably from Carl Zillis was uh, polarized light imaging, which is a technique that relies on a similar phenomenon as, as polarization sensitive OCT. It relies on the biofringence of myelin. Yeah. Uh, but it uh, with, with PLI, you actually have to slice the up the sample, and then you can um, you image it slice by slice. So it's similar to histology. You have the issue of how to register across slices, which can be um, challenging to match, you know, axon by axon across slices. Polarization sensitive OCT, we can we actually image the superficial layer of the tissue before we cut it. Okay. So we image a slice and then cut it, and then image the next slice. Okay. And so you end up with slices that are perfectly registered. Oh, yeah. yeah you can do it in a much, in much smaller samples. We cannot do, you know, those beautiful whole human brain images from that, the, that PLI researchers um, image. But again, it's, it's, it's what I said before. There is no technique that can give you the, the perfect answer for everything in the brain. So you have to kind of integrate uh, uh, from the results that you get from all of those techniques. Yeah. And at least it, it would be nice to know, like, for instance, that, you know, once you do get the answer you'll you'll kind of potentially be able to extract it you know there might be a signature of you know mm -hmm. of what and once again it could be a prior of what's most likely crossing or, or not that you could sort of fill in in that regard but um yeah so i i think that we are we have been through the, the first phase where we have used these techniques mainly to uh, validate existing methods and figure out which methods are more accurate than which. And I think that the big bet for, for the next step will be how to use these postmortem data, not just to assess the accuracy of existing techniques, but to engineer the next generation of techniques. And that's we're trying to find the, the mapping between the fiber architectures and the diffusion signal by using um, these postmortem data to, um, to train um, an algorithm that can do that is something that I'm interested in working on in, in the next uh, decade, let's say. That's a lot of work and it's <laughs> worthwhile and it's exciting. I remember about maybe 10 years ago hearing, you know, having some excitement about manganese tracers, you know, where you inject manganese and it's MR sensitive and it also follows uh, retrograde activity. Mm -hmm. So you can potentially trace connections and it seems to have disappeared, at least from my perspective, it seems to have disappeared a little bit. I don't yeah, know. So, yeah. So with MR visible tracers, you are um, still bound to the resolution of the MRI. Whereas with these other techniques, you are not bound by that. You can, with histology and with optical imaging, you, there really is no bound other than the time that you have to collect the the data you you can go to any resolution that that you want so and and it's also the case that those tracers are a little bit less sensitive than the kinds of tracers that um, that anatomists use so they will 
show you the the main sort of pathways, but you know you won't get all the terminations, etc. Yeah. But I think those early studies were were very valuable just to show the the importance of um, of collecting sort of an independent source of information on on connectional anatomy. There been I remember talking to a couple of people trying to build the ultimate uh, diffusion tensor or or tractography phantoms, uh, which seems like it would require some pretty amazing engineering. Uh, and I don't even know if it's possible at, at the resolution. The ultimate phantom is the brain. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Exactly. It's, you know, it's, people have been talking about building perfusion phantoms and things like that as well. And, and yeah, it's, it's better to just use a human brain. And <laughs> phantoms have their place, absolutely. For, for, for calibrating scanners and for ensuring scanner stability and, you know, for, 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 for benchmarking different methods. But ultimately, if you know how well a method is going to work on a phantom, it's that doesn't help you in figuring out when you get a, a, a result from tractography, you know, is that correct or incorrect? That you can only get from from the from the human brain. Back up a little bit with with the gold standard sort of you know comparisons. Is the ultimate goal to, I mean, obviously it would be nice to answer those questions about, you know, what is, you know, but if you can't image at that resolution, if you can't even get down to it, and if there's no hope to do that, I mean, then the the advantage is just simply to kind of validate a little bit what the underlying structure is. But still, if it's if it's unknown, if it's still an inverse problem, that you know, we give the exact same solution with MR regardless of whether it's crossing or or, or touching. How can you? How is it beneficial practically? Right. So it's a good question whether it is really an ill posed problem or not. Or whether it is ill posed because of the the ways in which we've analyzed the data so far. So it's possible that once you get that because we've we've discarded some information from the data to get the orientation distribution function, we've sort of made our our problem ill posed. And I should say that that at the time when those methods were introduced, that was absolutely the right thing to do because the there was lower SNR, less fewer directions. Uh, lower contrast. So having those uh, data reduction methods was critical to get any useful information out of the data. Okay. The question is, as the data has improved, have we now gotten to the point where the, the ways that we're analyzing the data are the problem more than they are the solution? And, you know, that's still an open problem to me. I, I think that I think that there is information in there that we're potentially discarding and that you should be able to get a different diffusion signature for a, um, let's say, a crossing versus a branching. Once you get to the ODF, it's impossible to just from a single ODF to to distinguish between those things. Right. So now I finally got, you, when you said that initially, now I fully understand what you're saying as far as, you know, reducing the data in some way uh, right now for our purposes is, is still, it might be, um, might want to take a few steps back and, and, and look very carefully at the data in a more raw form or, or try to find other avenues of combining it or putting it together in that regard. Is our, our way to point us to where to look next? Your work has also developed uh, what's called the, the conductance model. I mean, so, and I really liked, you know, from what I read, as far as that's concerned, you know, you want to come up with a sort of a metric to sort of measure, you know, if you, you, you can have certainly maps that are very beautiful and informative, but it's nice to come up with a measure of connectivity that you can sort of say, you know, it's, this is more connected or not. And, and so maybe if you want to talk a little bit about your conductance model. Um, so that actually is worked by a collaborator of mine uh, within the Free Surfer group, uh, Iman Aganj. Okay. Um, so I cannot take credit for that. So <laughs> this is an idea for um, coming up with um, a, a way to, around the fact that um, you can have multiple, you can have connectivity uh, because of not just A being connected to B, but A being connected to B and B being connected to C, hence A is connected to C. And so the, his conductance model is a way to quantify that and then to be able to uh, compare that across populations. And, and in his case, he's interested a lot in, in Alzheimer's disease um, and seeing how these... Um, 
uh, these connectivity maps are altered in, uh, in aging, healthy aging, and, and in and Alzheimer's. Yeah, the issue of how to define connectivity is a, is a big question. Obviously, there are also these two very different things that are called connectivity, you know, from fMRI versus from diffusion. And people tend to, see, to expect that, you know, you should get the same answer from both. But actually, the, the only thing that these two things have in common is, is the name. <laughs> So you, you know, you, you will get a certain connectivity from diffusion MRI, even from a dead brain that does not have any functional connectivity. And so that should tell you that those two things are not, are not supposed to be correlated. And also functional connectivity will, uh, will be different depending on, you know, whether you had a Red Bull or whether you had coffee or whether you had a lot of sleep that day, whereas, um, you know, your, your accents are, are going to be there no matter what. Yeah, that's actually, so that, that's, so I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, cause that's always been something that I've been paying attention to as well. Like in the, in the, in the neural modeling field, you know, everyone wants to put to, to make connectivity matrices or connectivity maps or, or measures of connectivity and, and even, you know, people who work with this prefer actually like, you know, Olaf Sporns, they, they actually prefer diffusion uh, uh, or track tracing or, you know, that sort of measure of connectivity as opposed to fMRI. And, and if you compare, yes, and, and this, I'd love to have your insight into this because it seems that there's, it's very complementary. Uh, certainly with fMRI, you can have two areas that, you know, are correlated, but then they're speaking to another area. And mm-hmm. so there's tracks not connecting them, but connecting them to something else. Mm-hmm. And, but also I've always thought that you can have con- functionally connected regions that are more than one, you know, axonal connection uh, apart that isn't, don't really follow a single track. It might follow multiple tracks to get to that, that area. And, and so it seems that it's like, you're, that's what you're, you know, you're implying with functional c- connectivity that that will change. So, and I'll, it seems that the, yeah, the diffusion, it will get better and better, but it's still kind of getting the, the super highways of the brain in some sense. And it might be get, getting down to more and more of the roads, but functional MRI is sort of, you know, any path that mm-hmm. shows connection. But I don't know if you want to add to yeah, that. Yeah, so actually that that's um, that's very correct. So what we found from our validation studies um, is that, at the default thresholds that tractography um, methods usually operate in, uh, we are operating at a pretty low false positive, low true positive um, point along the ROC curve. Um, and so that means that uh, we're not getting a lot of false connections, but we're also missing um, some of the trickier, maybe smaller true connections. Right. Um, so it's true that what we get, especially when we get sort of the, the whole brain, you know, connectivity matrix um, is going to probably be missing a lot of connections. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's, that's another issue that, that we need to address with um, the, the information that we get, the insights that we get from the, from the validation studies. But certainly one aspect of, of the, you know, the, the structural versus functional connectivity comparison is that people tend to think that some um, analysis method that they apply to one kind of matrix will, will also work for the other. But it's important to remember that these came from completely different, you know, the physics, the math, everything up to the point where you put the data through the meat grinder and you come up with a matrix is is completely different. Uh, One thing that I um, that I hear from time to time that I think is an influence from from fMRI is that people tell me, yeah, there are all these errors in tractography, but I'm going to get my results from averaging a thousand brains. And so that's going to get rid of the errors. And I think that that comes from, uh, from fMRI where, you know, yeah. you'll add more runs per subject, you add more subjects, you know, you average more, you get rid of uh, the errors because the errors that you're dealing uh, with there are random fluctuations in the signal that you're trying to get rid of by averaging. And indeed, you will reduce variance when you average. But what we see with, um, in our validation studies is that a lot of the errors in tractography are not random. Of course, there are there's there are random errors due to noise. You know, it's noisy data after all. But there are certain errors that happen consistently in certain areas of the brain. You see them across subjects, across species, even. And so that is a, an, a type of error due to bias, not due to variance. Yeah. And so by averaging a thousand brains, 
you will get rid of the, or reduce the variance, but you will not get rid of the, the bias. In yeah. fact, you will enhance those errors. And so you will get some things that are, you know, very reliable, but also very wrong. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to remember that, that, you know, something that works in one kind of connectivity doesn't work in the other. Yeah, and even I would even argue that it doesn't necessarily work in in functional connectivity as in resting state or whatever connectivity as well, because you know we're one of the big areas in fri we're going towards looking at we're realizing that there's individual differences that are real. It's not just noise, and that are correlated with behavior and development and all kinds of things. And it seems that is there similar. Uh, I mean, you have some work along you know tr tracks of lifespan, and are there similar findings that you are you finding like the equivalent mm -hmm. of a biomarker in some regard? So in terms of biomarkers, yeah, that's um, that's still very much a, an open question on what is the you know the best way to use diffusion MRI as a biomarker. And there is absolutely the the interest that you mentioned towards going to individualized um, interventions. You know, using individual scans to predict um, clinical outcomes, et cetera. And I think there is where combining the, the fMRI, either resting state or, or task type connectivity, and the, uh, the connectivity that you get from diffusion will be a strength because it will, uh, there's actually work by one of my collaborators, uh, Sue Whitfield Gabrielli, that shows that as you add the, uh, the functional connectivity measures and the, the diffusion measures, then you increase uh, predictive power. So there, the, actually, it's a good thing that those two things are not correlated and they're not giving you the same information. So then it's, I think, is a strength to, to combine them. Uh, in terms of what you said about, you know, the individual differences that get lost when you average too much or many brains, that's absolutely something that we've seen in the, in the work that I've been doing with Suzanne Haber, where now we're not trying to look at the big highways, but trying to look at the topographies within those highways, the little bundles that go through these big highways. That's so nice. those topographies, you see them replicate to a big extent across individuals, but the little bundles are not exactly in the same location um, across individuals. So when you average, you're going to lose that topography. And so certainly uh, the push towards better individual data is it makes a lot of sense in, in diffusion imaging as well. Yeah, especially in the context of, I mean, and, and I was going to start talking about clinical applications, but especially if you're trying to find like guidance for deep brain stimulation or things like that, it might seem like it would be useful to, to map out the, the fiber mm -hmm. tracks from the various capsules and, and, and things mm -hmm. like thalamus and whatever, and as it might vary a little bit. And it's significant. Yeah, Back to the one more question about the fMRI correlation uh, correspondence. So typically in fMRI, you know, we have a very easy measure of connectivity, not just the amount of correlation. And it's just, it may not be perfect, but it's, it's, a, it's a useful metric. It's easy to take, it's easy to get. But with connectivity, that might be related to your conductance model in some sense, but uh, with fiber tracks, how do you actually quantify strength of connectivity? Is it just simply the diameter of the number of tracks or is that, is that necessarily a valid assumption? Or? Yeah, that is, that is very much an open uh, question. So when you, when you get those connectivity matrices from, from tractography, you, one of the choices they have to make is how to define the, the strength of um, of an edge in the in the network, and the number of of streamlines has been one that a lot of people have used. Then there is a whole wealth of microstructural measures that we can get from diffusion MRI. Uh, you know, starting from the traditional um, tensor-based measures like FA and diffusivity, etc., to a whole host of of models uh, and parameters uh, that exist now that can be. Um, estimated from today's data. So that, yeah, that is, that is very much an open question. There is, there's just a whole other layer that, like you said, it's not just a correlating to time courses and yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't have the answer to yeah. that. Yet. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's a, I mean, it seems like a very, I mean, it's sort of related to, you know, what the assumptions you make in, in the model and it seems, yeah, it, it, I mean, definitely that's good that, you know, it's an open question then. So it's, uh, I think it's answerable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point I'm, I'm, I'm pretty busy trying to get the, the bundles right and how to weigh them is, is kind of the, the next step. 
program. Yeah, I remember. I remember um, there was a researcher who, yeah, I mean, it, along those lines, there was a researcher who was trying to look at, you know, the big mystery of, uh, for instance, traumatic brain injury is that the brains look perfectly normal, but the the shearing has broken some of the connections. And I think he was trying to come up with a measure of, you know, the number of connections broken. And I don't know if that's valid or not, but I mean, certainly, yeah, this is where DTI has direct applications where or, or track tracing as well. I mean, in looking at traumatic brain injury, that's one one of many examples. But Yeah, so traumatic brain injury, trying to predict the outcome of that, that is definitely a, a one potential application. And then any sort of uh, intervention that requires a target in the white matter, whether it's, uh, you know, deep brain stimulation or surgical procedures, those are all um, potential, uh, potential clinical applications where actually diffusion MRI is being actively um, used. So for, for the other stuff, you know, that it's, there's still a lot of work to do, especially for, for psychiatric applications, et cetera. Yeah. But it seems that there's, I mean, from some of your papers with your collaborators, I mean, it seems that there's a lot of, I mean, you're at the early stages, but uh, there's some really interesting findings regarding relationships between, uh, you know, fiber track tracing and, you know, connectivity, our, our, our. Yeah, so the, the, now that the data has gotten better, the next step of the Human Connection Project was to apply those imaging methods and those protocols from the Human Connection Project to disease populations. And those data will be coming online soon. So the, the one Human Connection Project, uh, Disease Human Connection Project that I was um, involved in with Sue Whitfield Gabrielli and John Gabrielli and others, that's the Boston Adolescent Neuroimaging of Depression and Anxiety, or BANDA. That's one of those uh, projects and and um, our data has been routed to the Connectome coordinating facility and and I'm sure that they'll make them um, available soon. So just uh, just going back really quickly to you were talking about right obviously the one of the advantages of, of, of looking at track tracing is that unlike functional connectivity it's sort of static but but certainly changes with development and aging it changes with disease. And, and there's even an open question, you know, that every once in a while I'll read a paper about how, you know, with learning or, or it might be related to, um, you know, language ability or, and how, what does, do people have a sense of what the time constant of change of at least white matter tracks um, or, you know, whatever uh, measures in this regard with disease or with learning or with how, what's the upper time? Uh, or um, <laughs> so people have, people have found changes even within a matter of, you know, of months in terms of learning and with things like traumatic brain injury, even weeks, you know, as the recovery happens. And, you know, in that case, it's not like the person grows different pathways. It's that the, um, uh, the microstructural properties of um, of the of the pathways, you know, may change or recover depending on on what condition we're talking about, and so that's where the biomarkers potentially will come from the from the microstructural measures rather than you know the. Um, the connectivity matrix. All right, that's actually right. That's a good insight. Where where it's actually the microstructural, the the yeah, the myelin, etc. Uh, and actually, you know, right, it would help. But but it's interesting when 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 you were talking about you know in the case of for instance Alzheimer's uh, in one of your papers, you it, it, it was sort of like well the tracks are related to the cortical thing. But um, but I was always wondering, you know, what what necessarily causes what? Do the tracks just become thinner or less because there's less activity, or is it somehow uh, a linked process in some sense? Yeah, um, that's another. Uh, you're asking me all the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, that is a, that's definitely an open question. Um, that would be an, an excellent topic for uh, for postmortem uh, validation. Uh, yeah, what is the chicken and what is the egg? Is the does the cortical change lead to the um, you know downstream change in the axons? And you know we've we've been talking a little bit. We've been throwing some ideas around about trying to combine all the different kinds of, of postmortem imaging that are happening at the center. You know, Bruce is working on the cortex. I'm working in the, the white matter. Then there's John Palmeni who's working in the vasculature. All of those things you would expect, you know, are somehow interconnected. One follows the other. And so, yeah, I, that, that would be a very exciting direction for the future, trying to figure out, you know, the, the sequence. Yeah, yeah, the sequence of events. Or the sequence, at least. Yeah, no, actually, okay. So that's, but it's nice, though. When you, when you have a nice tool like this, you could actually ask these questions 
to some degree. And so it's it's beautiful how, you know, like this tool opens up, it really does open up the field and it opens up the types of questions you can ask. The cliche, but we're just scratching the surface. Well, yeah, yeah. And 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 your and your group is doing it really well. I mean, you have all these amazing tools and packages and and you have the people that that can collaborate as far as that's concerned. I had I had one question in my head, but uh, but maybe I'll just go on to yeah. Let's let's talk a, a little bit about the maybe the Connectome scanner. You know, one of the things great that's great about one of the wonderful things about uh, at least you know it was nice that the NIH sort of put out this sort of you know had this vision of of coming up mm-hmm. with. Uh, imaging the connectome. They felt the field was mature enough and, and your group was perfect for building this connectome scanner. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, what makes it special? Yeah. So the first, the first connectome scanner was the, the, was the MGH component of the human connectome project. Obviously there were many other sites, uh, including, you know, Minnesota and, and Wash U that, that handled different aspects of the human connectome project. The side of, of the, the MGH side of things got funded only to build the scanner. And so that, that was the, the deliverable from the, from connectome 1.0. The idea, like I said, with the scanner was to make the gradient stronger and, um, therefore allow higher SNR, uh, at, at higher B values. One of the things that you did bring up that does make things tricky is the slew rate. Um, so how fast you can get to that maximum gradient strength. And that is one uh, big aspect that the Connectome 2.0 is, is trying to address. So for the, for the next uh, iteration of the Connectome scanner, the idea is to increase the maximum gradient strength as well. So to go from uh, 300 to 500 millitesla per meter, but especially to increase the maximum slew rate. So to go from 200 in the first connectome system to 600. And the reason this is important is obviously for the, for conventional diffusion imaging, but especially if you're going to play those more um, complicated types of gradient pulses like oscillating gradients, et cetera, there the, the slew rate is very important. And it may be even more important than, than the GMAX and what's what's limiting the applicability of some of those methods in uh, in human scanners. So the idea for the Connectome 2, it was more motivated from the microstructure side of things rather than the tractography side of things. So to make these uh, more sophisticated diffusion encodings possible in the whole brain at high resolution in a, in a human scanner. And uh, it's going to be a little different than the, the design of the of the first connectome scanner. It's going to be a um, head-only system. And uh, I would highly recommend actually for you to invite Susie Huang to talk about the hardware specs at at great uh, detail. Yeah, I will. I will. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, yeah, no, that's, I'm glad you say that because I, I've in the very old early days, I guess it was, it's actually already been 30 years ago that we, we first did echoplanar imaging, but we as a a local grading coil, we built out a sewer pipe and wire and stuck it together. And, uh, and it was great because it could actually, you know, it was low inductance. And also, and especially today now, um, you can have much higher slew rates. And because the, you know, the return fields, the gradients are are, are contained to some, I mean, there's certainly some worry around the shoulders, but mm-hmm. it, it you can go much faster without worrying about biological stimulation, uh, which is which is really hard to get around <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. yeah, the BNS thresholds can be much higher in a, in a head-only system. And also another motivation for uh, going to that design was that the recent experience that Siemens has had building the uh, the Berkeley 70 um, yeah. system. And so some of that knowledge will, that also has a high high GMAX and, and high slew rate. And so some of that knowledge will will transfer towards the, the connectome too. Yeah, that's that's exciting. That's really. But it's it's still a three T, so you know. Well, that's another question. (laughs) Yeah, that's the question I was going to ask, and this is what I sort of asked. You know, it's sort of interesting how Libby Han, um, you know, loves diffusion imaging, but then he wants eleven point seven Tesla, and he realizes, and and it's true that, you know, you have diminishing returns with diffusion imaging at higher fields. Sure, you gain sensitivity, but the T2 stars and T2s go down fast. And so do you think three Tesla is about optimal? Or do you think that if you go to seven Tesla and figure out how to image faster, that will be optimal? <laughs> Maybe we should do that study when we have the new scanner, you know, compared to the to the Berkeley system. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Because they're, they're putting it on a seven Tesla. So yeah. that's that's exactly the thing to do. I actually, I think, I think seven... 
I think we'll start to image fast enough with seven. And, and who knows? And that actually brought up the question I was going to ask before. And that is, you know, certainly you have all these amazing algorithms for, for looking at, for, for out, of, out of diffusion information, you're creating fiber tracks. But it seems that, I, you know, it just hit me that, that these could be applied, and they already probably are in many different contexts, could be applied in other types of sort of anisotropic or linked structure in the brain. Uh, you have, you know, the vasculature, you could actually make vasculature maps using these mm-hmm. tools. You have susceptibility in general of non-vasculature that could, you could make these, you know, iron or, you know, whatever you could make, there's all kinds of structure or MT contrast or, or all kinds of things that you could make informative, if not tracks, but informable mm-hmm. informative tensor maps or something from this. Um, I don't know. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't know absolutely. So in terms of the vasculature, yeah, that's, you can, it, it's complementary information again. And it's one of those things where you don't, you don't expect them to agree, but perhaps you can get some complementary information about, let's say, the metabolic needs of, of different tracts. So whether the, the vasculature follows the, the fibers or the fibers follow the vas- vasculature and how these things change in disease, there's a lot of opportunities there for, for multimodal uh, imaging. Okay, uh, last uh, last part uh, really quickly. Um, so right, so that connectome scanner, the connectome 2, is that going to, once again, that will be another... So I, I always, I'm always amazed with how much, um, you know, it's nice about where you are. It's like, it was an old, I guess, torpedo factory that was almost turned into a shopping mall, but it's like tons of space <laughs> and you can keep on adding scanners all over the place. It's great. Well, uh, I don't know about tons of space. Well, we're always short on space yeah. you know, because we keep, we keep adding scanners and we keep adding people. So. Yep. They're going to have to fill in that whole atrium they, you know, yeah. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's that's exciting. And so you're going to keep your others, the whole body. Scan. No, it's, it's going to replace them. Okay. So, yeah. So there's going to be a connect on one on, on, on Boston Craigslist, if you're interested. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's interesting. I'm kidding. It's not going to be on Craigslist. <laughs> I, I do wonder what they're going to do with it now. It's, it's, somebody's going to well, do it. Well, if you're interested in it, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> okay. So is there any, um, so so you sort of hinted at some of the future. So, uh, you know, what what most is, is most interesting to you as far as, um, you know, directions that, that this can go? I mean, I, certainly there's the hardware, there's the sort of verification, and then there's mm-hmm. the, the sort of processing and also clinical imp- imp- implementation. It seems like clinically, you know, even for pre-surgical mapping, you've got to have a, a software suite that's usable in some regard. And that seems like it's a, another challenge. But what's what's most interesting to you as far as the future? A lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so certainly in, in the last few years, I've taken this more uh, sort of experimental detour uh, with, uh, with the validation studies. And we have gained several insights uh, into what is going wrong with uh, the existing methods, the types of, of uh, configurations and, and brain areas that are tricky for existing methods. And we have gained some insights that we're now ready to go back and, and work into analysis algorithms. So I'm definitely uh, looking forward to going back to more um, algorithmic development work, but still keep going on the uh, on the postmortem data analysis to get us more and more uh, training data to train those um, those algorithms. Definitely continuing the the work that we're doing with uh, Suzanne Haber on uh, matching the uh, you know the the traditional anatomy with uh, with diffusion MRI. That has been a, a, a big school for me. <laughs> it's those two areas are really. Uh, they speak different languages. You know, for us in the in the algorithm development side of things, uh, everything you know is ones and zeros. Whereas it's all data. You know, it doesn't matter. It's this bundle or the bundle next to it. In anatomy, you can someone someone can build their entire career on you know a tiny sub nucleus of something. Whereas my grant reviewers say, well if you can't do it in the whole brain, what's the point? <laughs> so, <laughs> but there is so much insight to be gained by going, zooming into a very specific structure and trying to get to the detail of what exactly is going on with that structure yeah. and what is going right and what is going wrong with, with our imaging methods. And once you, you can gain insights that you can then go back and you know, used to improve your your meat grinders for your whole brain um, <laughs> data. 
Um, so definitely trying to make that translation um, between the languages of, of these two worlds and try to automate more the, the process of um, also of proce processing the, the tracing data. That's a, that's a new project, a new R01 project that we have with Suzanne. So that's, that's definitely a, a trying to get more of her, more information out of her uh, collection and, and making that um, available. So we'll also continue our work uh, with uh, open challenges and engaging the, the community, like with the R and track challenge that we just um, completed. And, and the, the draft of the paper is, is waiting on my computer to read after, okay. this, after <laughs> this conversation. Um, yeah, so these are the, the big um, uh, directions for me and also trying to figure out as our data gets better, how can we make sure that we're getting all of the information out there uh, out of that data about different fiber configurations. And yeah, the, I mean, the, the clinical applications are kind of a, a step removed from all of this. I think in the next five to 10 years, I, I want to say that our methods will have improved vastly and hopefully have caught up with how much our data um, have improved. Yeah. Um, and so then we can we can use it as a, a more reliably uh, and accurately as a as a tool for um, clinical uh, decision making. Yeah, I mean, even so, it seems like the, it's already there as far as you know, clinical decision making. I mean, I, my guess is that, like for instance, if you just had a good way of just robustly and easily measuring tracks, and for instance, let's say you had a tumor and there was and you needed to do fractionated radiation treatment or something like that, and you need to plan it, you just, you really want to avoid the tracks. And let's say it goes around the tumor, you just have to, you know, you, it's really useful to see where the tracks are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there it's possible that the big highways that we are already very good at imaging are enough. So if you're looking, you know, for the corticospinal tract or the arcuate, right. uh, which are major, um, you know, targets for surgical um, applications, then diffusion MRI at, at, at its current state is great for that. It's when you're getting into those trickier, you know, subcortical, smaller bundles where, you know, that, that are a little bit more contentious and, and um, there is also less um, information from um, the anatomy on that and where, you know, we need to keep kind of progressing on both sides, both uh, on the anatomy and on improving the, the imaging methods. Yeah. And it could have real insight into, right. I mean, even the mechanisms of, of, of you know, psychiatric disorders or things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's so much potential. That's, it's really exciting. All right. Well, with that, I'd just like to, yeah, thank you. This has been a really, really st stimulating discussion. And I don't know if you wanted to add anything or anything like that as well, that you think we that, that I haven't covered, but uh, <laughs> um, well, I think this, this was a good, um, good overview for your listeners. Well, good. if they have any questions, they can always um, ask on, on Twitter under the, <laughs> the podcast link. <laughs> okay. Or else they can, I'm sure you can, they, they can find your email or whatever yes. and ask you. It's easy in academia at least. And so, so yeah, thank you very much again. This was, this was great. Thank you for having me, Peter. It was a pleasure. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Ekaterina Dobrikova and Anastasia Brovkin. <laughs>